Let's pray. O oh Lord, our God, would you speak to us by your holy word this morning? Holy Spirit, I ask that you in particular would bring uh, conviction and clarity to our hearts, each of us as individuals. Lord, about the ways in which we may be inclined to show favoritism or partiality. Lord, root this out in our hearts. Lord, and cause us uh, to, uh, to love even as you do. Lord, speak to us by your word now, we pray in Jesus' name. Well, good morning, church. So good to uh, see you this morning. Rainy, cold day, so glad you're here uh, with us. I'm Michael White. I get to serve as one of the pastors here. So thankful uh, for this church. We're actually a church that's led not just by me, but by a plurality of elders, multiple guys seeking to shepherd this flock. And so I just get to have the privilege of leading those guys, leading this church. And I get to do most of the preaching and teaching, but, but not all of it. So we're thankful that you're here. If you're a guest, I see a number of you out there uh, today. So we're glad you're here uh, with us. And also want to say hello to folks who are joining us right now, even online. I know there's a lot of sickness. There's sickness in my house even this morning, so they're online. And uh, so thanks, one, for keeping your germs at home. <laughs> um, but uh, we, we hate that you're not here with us. And so I uh, pray that the Lord will allow us all to get back together in uh, healthy ways as, uh, as soon as possible. So I don't know if you are aware of this, but there's a, there's a game tonight. There's a, a Super Bowl, yeah? Okay, some of you seem like maybe you are aware of that. Um, Tonight for the Super Bowl, it's Super Bowl 57, if I got the Roman numerals right, it's so hard to read those things for me, but uh, J Jalen Hurts is taking the field, right, for the Philadelphia Eagles, the quarterback, maybe you know that, and and Hurts, I think, is the reason, this is not, by the way, a, a sermon on sports commentary, but we got to start here, right, like, we got to start here, um, so, like, Hurts, I think, is the reason, main reason the, the Eagles are in the Super Bowl, he's had a great year, MVP, MVP cal caliber year. Um, he doesn't put up the stats. Of course, he missed a few games at the end. He hasn't put up the stats that Mahomes uh, has put up. Um, but he's been able to move the chains, sometimes with his feet. He's been efficient. He's been accurate. He's 16-1 as a starter this year. Um, he is why many people, including myself, are picking the Eagles tonight. I know there are Chiefs fans out here as well. Joe Cooper, Dana, wherever you are. Um, okay, there you are. Sorry, I was looking. I was like, he's not in the booth. He's right here. So again, well, that's not personal. Um, it's not personal, but uh, you would think that Hertz would be uh, adored and uh, and uh, supported uh, around the league and by Eagles fans, especially. And and now he is. But I just want to go back in time a little bit and say it wasn't always this way. So when Jalen Hurts was drafted by the Philadelphia Eagle, Eagles three short years ago. Um, it was not well received. And so if you don't know, if you're not a sports fan, if you don't care about the game tonight, if you don't, the, the NFL draft is basically a more hyped version of what a lot of us used to do on the playground growing up. We would pick and choose our teams, right? And so the NFL draft is a chance to pick and choose, like, who's going to be on your team. And so when Jalen Hurts, the quarterback coming out of Oklahoma, was picked um, in the second round of the 2000 draft, it was not a popular choice. It was not a popular choice. And so one local sports reporter, Philly uh, reporters are notoriously um, uh, mean. <laughs> um, he said, he said, dumb, 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 dumb. That was his comment on, uh, on the uh, pick of Jalen Hurts. Wow, <laughs> said another, not wow in a good way. Wow, in a sarcastic way. People were calling for the Eagles general manager who made that decision to be fired and national pundits around uh, the country were basically rating this choice of Jalen Hurts, the quarterback who's starting tonight, they were rating it a very poor choice, saying it was either a C plus or a D. And meanwhile, 63% of the Eagles fans said, ah, that's an F. <laughs> we're going to give this pick an F. Well, tonight he's starting in the Super Bowl. Wh what is the point of all of this? Well, the point is, is that all of us make choices all of us make choices, all of us pick favorites, all of us discriminate and show preferences towards people, and, and sometimes our choices wind out not being very good. They come from limited knowledge, uh, bad knowledge, sometimes even worse, sometimes they come from evil thoughts and bad motives. And so this morning, as we continue working through the letter that James wrote to early Christians, 
we're going to see that James talk, takes on exactly this tendency in us. This tendency to show preferences and partiality and favoritism based on our limited wisdom or our preferences or, or our desires. So James is writing his audience, these scattered Christians in churches all throughout Palestine. He's writing them so they will grow up and be mature and complete like nothing spiritually in all. So in his letter, he's addressing all kinds of practical topics, and this is one of those that he's addressing this morning. And so what he's got arguing in this text, verses 1 to 13 that Melina just read, what he's arguing, what we're going to talk about today is this. Christian, stop playing favorites. Stop playing favorites and show mercy toward others instead. Christian, stop playing favorites and show mercy toward others instead. And so as we walk through this text this morning here in James chapter 2, we're actually going to see that James gives us three reasons. Three reasons that we need to get out of this, this partiality game that we play with other people. Putting in people in categories and preferences is the game so first he says first reason he gives is because you're a bad judge you're not a good judge just like those philly fans weren't a good judge of that pick because it turns out hurts is a pretty decent quarterback second it's because you're a really bad sinner so you're a really bad sinner he's going to talk about that and then third and by conclusion he's going to say you're really in need of mercy you're really in need of mercy and so let's get right to it James chapter 2 verse 1 we get James's first imperative imperative is a command right out of the gate look there chapter 2 verse 1 my brothers and sisters show no partiality that's the command show no partiality as you hold the faith in our Lord Jesus Christ the Lord of glory so just notice right away, he, he starts again with this term of affection. My brothers and sisters, it, uh, it, it permeates the letter. It usually signals he's moving on to a new topic in the letter. Um, but but it, it shows up over and over again. And so there's a lot of affection here that he has for the folks that he's writing to. But there's also a great deal of urgency. He's saying Christians must not show partiality. So let's define our terms. What are we talking about here? Well, partiality is treating people with favoritism. It's discriminating against people. It's, it's picking and choosing who you will and you won't associate with for whatever reason. And so partiality can be rooted in something as, as vile as racism, or it could be as relatively innocent as a sports team preference. Maybe you don't want to hang out with Chiefs fans. Joe, I don't feel that way about you, friend right and so it could it could come in all sorts of different shapes and forms as we dive into this i think i just need to say and be aware of some of you have experienced partiality in really existential ways really personal deep maybe even painful ways or maybe you've experienced partiality in positive ways you had the joy and the privilege of being the favorite child of your parents or you had the agony and feeling like you were not maybe the favorite child. You were overlooked. Maybe you felt you were less than a sibling or someone else in your own family. It's really, really painful. So James, as he starts this admonition, he's clear Regardless of what may have happened in your biological family, your family of upbringing, he says there is to be no partiality. That mentality cannot exist in this family, the family of God. And that's because, if you just look back at the verse, there's supposed to be only one favorite in the family of God, one person to whom all love and all esteem and all reverence is due, and that is Jesus Christ, the Lord of glory. We're to rally around him and cherish and celebrate and treasure him above all else, above all people. And as we treasure and cherish him, our differences and preferences fade into the background. 
And so he gives us this imperative right away. Show no partiality. Then in the rest, he's going to unpack his reasoning here. And the, the first reason, or at least my summary of it, is that we shouldn't show partiality. You shouldn't show partiality because you are a really bad judge. You're a bad judge of what should be esteemed and what shouldn't. And so here is his example. Verse 2, For if a man wearing a gold ring and fine clothing comes into your assembly and a poor man in shabby clothes also comes in, and if you pay attention to the one who wears the fine clothing and you say, you sit over here in a good place, but you say to the poor man, you, you stand over there or sit down here at my feet. Have you not then made distinctions among yourselves and become judges with evil thoughts? So we should just say this is probably a real life scenario that he's addressing the recipients of this letter were facing. They had fled from Jerusalem after persecution. They were resettling in new places uh, throughout the area that's now modern day Syria. And as they did that, there were people who were settling well and people who were still struggling to find employment and set up new lives. There were haves and there were have-nots among them. And so we see here that the church is meeting. Possibly this is the Lord's Day worship gathering, even as we're doing right now. Possible also that it was some other assembly. But in walk two people. One person clearly is well-to-do, just by looking. Another person clearly is not. One gets the prime seating. One has to stand or sit on the floor. And so James bottom lines the issue for us in verse 4, right? What's the problem with that? Well, you've made distinctions among yourselves and become judges with evil thoughts. And that's really it, isn't it? That's exactly what's going on. We're tempted to show some sort of preference towards someone, and in that moment, we're making judgments about them. We're determining things about them. We're doing quick speed of light calculations in our minds taking in who they appear to be processing whether that's somebody we want to be with or be around with even processing is this someone that maybe can do something for me and then we're interacting with them on the basis of those calculations and determinations our judgments basically we're sitting like a judge at the bench banging the gavel upholding our own version of the law deciding for ourselves what is good and what is not and james is not going to hear about that verse five he says listen listen my beloved brothers and sisters again there's a lot of affection here but there's a lot of urgency has not god chosen those who are poor in the world to be rich in faith and heirs of the kingdom which he's promised to those who loved him but you you have dishonored the poor man so let's untangle this what are they doing well they're doing exactly what eagles fans did to jalen hurts right they're judging with wrong standards and incomplete information and so actually they're rejecting the very people that god has chosen is that ironic what did jesus say <laughs> blessed are you who are poor for yours is the kingdom of god and jesus himself right came from a poor family he himself said foxes have dens and birds have nests but i the son of man have no place to lay my head church people are rejecting the very people that God has chosen even as Jesus himself was rejected and again it's not just James's audience that is kind of in fire here friends it's us it's us so I hope you're not offended when I say this, but you are a, ju a bad judge. You're a bad judge. 
because often you judge with wrong standards. In fact, you are probably the kind of person, certainly would include myself in this, so don't, let's not get twisted there. We are the kind of people who would have rejected Jesus. Because he didn't measure up to whatever messianic expectation we had for him. But let's go farther than that and let's ask this question. Who are the people in your life, your life right now that you are tempted to show partiality to? And by partiality, I mean either in a negative way, meaning I'm pushing these folks away, or in a positive way, I want to wrap my arms around these people and bring them close to me. This is a thing we're really, really good at as human beings, and it's something, sadly, that we are really, really good at, even as followers of Christ. So let me just run through some things to help you think about the way this may surface in your life. I cannot believe you voted for a Democrat. How could you do that? I can't believe you voted for Trump. How could you do that? How, how can you send your kids to public school? Are, are you going to let Caesar disciple your kids? Are you really going to homeschool your kids and shelter them like that? See, it cuts both ways. You mean you didn't get vaccinated against COVID? Wait, you got the jab? Man, she is such a typical white girl. <laughs> black people, black people always act like that. These Hispanics, man, they are really taking over. All these Yankees keep moving down here. Felt safe to laugh on that one? All right. <laughs> we can all agree we don't like the Yankees. Those people from Charlotte moving up here and trying to take our land. You young people. Oh, you old folks. I would never shop at Aldi. I've got to check out myself and bring my own bags. I only shop at Aldi. Well, you know, they're on Medicaid and WIC. Well, you know, they've got a house down at the beach. I only have time for my family. I've had the same group of friends since high school, and I don't need anyone else. Here's one. All these new people at Freedom. <laughs> I can't break in with these Freedom people. He looks like he only shops at Goodwill. She looks like she just walked out of Table Co. Or wherever it el else your favorite boutique is. <laughs> Friends, we could go on and on, right? We make distinctions. We do invisibly, silently, maybe even subconsciously. We make distinctions. Some of that is, is probably non sinful, right? We're just observing our world, you know. We can't we can't not observe. Um, but then on the basis of that though, we move into the realm of sin. Because then we start to assign judgments. And then on the basis of that judgment, then we begin to show partiality. We begin to treat people differently according to who they are, whether they're in our tribe or not in our tribe, whether they can give something to us or not, whether they're going to take a lot from us. We can sometimes assume the worst, or sometimes we can assume the best in wrong ways, and we treat others on the basis of our assumptions and our judgments about them instead of actually getting to
to know them and loving them. And here's what we say. We say, I, I, I can't have anything in common with somebody like him. Or we say, I'm not going to waste my time with people like her. Or let's, let's flip it around. Because we like to play favorites with people who are already like us, right? And so we'll say, well, we just click because we're, we're in the same phase of life. Or we'll say, we connected because we just, we just tend to think the same way about things. Or it's just easy around them. Or we, we understand each other. We like the same things. We do the same things. My brothers and sisters, look back at verse 1. Show no partiality as you hold the faith in our Lord Jesus Christ who is the Lord of glory the truth is sometimes actually you are not the best judge for who is best for you sometimes you might be right but sometimes it might be people who are different from you that are actually best for your growth in Christian maturity. And you're actually stunting your own growth because you're withholding yourself from people who might challenge and push you. Friends, can I just step out of this intense moment and just say, like, it is one of the best things about being your pastor that I get to interface in coffees and lunches and conversations just wherever with all of the diversity that's represented in this room and, and honestly a lot of the diversity that I represented in that long list of things I have the privilege and joy to listen to and learn from people all across the spectrum who maybe are different than me in various ways it's such a privilege and a joy such a help for me to correct you know my own bad ways of thinking and friends I would just say to you you have the same opportunity you have the same opportunity here to cross pollinate to not sit in the same exact spot every single week to meet someone different or new and to strike up a relationship that would help you and make a gospel connection here. If we go to Ephesians 2, we see that Jesus Christ has torn down the dividing wall of hostility between peoples. There is ethnicity, it's between Jew and Greek, but he's torn down the dividing wall of hostility between all kinds of boundaries. And he has made us one in Christ. He's made us one in Christ, if you're a Christian. And so, friends, my prayer is that we would be one indeed. Now, just a few clarifications. I'm not preaching this because I think there's some kind of massive disunity in our church. Um, there's massive disunity in the culture, right? So hopefully this is a timely word for you to think through relationships and things out there. Second, I, I'm not saying this because I think biblically you're you know, the command to not show partiality means that you've got to be the same level of friend with every person in this room or in our city or in the world, right? Because that's not possible. The command, the imperative not to show partiality is not to treat people differently based on the judgments you're making about them. It is to love no matter what. To recognize that we're really bad judges because we judge with wrong standards. Often we judge others in self-serving, self-interested ways. I mean, you, you see, this is what James is going after here, right? In this context, they're shunning the poor, and he's saying, hey guys, by the way, you remember, they're the ones that are going to inherit the kingdom. The Messiah that supposedly we're worshiping, he was in that category. So that just shows that we can get things twisted, not think about others in the right 
way. Look, look what else James uh, goes on to say in, uh, in verse 6. He says, look, are you not, are, are you not aware that the, the rich ones are the ones that are oppressing you and the ones who are dragging you into court? This, by the way, is not a, um, if you are wealthy here, <laughs> this is not a shot against you necessarily. This is something that was happening in their context. The rich were, were able to take advantage of those who, who didn't have as much. Um, and so that's certainly a temptation in, in history that I would caution you against. But this, this is a historical circumstance that he's writing against. And it's, it's interesting, right? The, the rich in this case are the ones that are actually the oppressors. They're ones who are blaspheming the Christian name by which people are called. And yet, when they show up, who is it that gets the favoritism? Right? Again, it's just showing what kind of judges we are. This is how we do, right? We'll show favoritism towards people who may or may not be good for us and actually sometimes are definitely not good for us, who may be in the middle of harming us, as seems to be the case here in James 2, 6. And we'll, we'll, we'll do that all because we think maybe, just maybe, there's a chance we'll have a shot at getting something from them that will help us. See how twisted that gets? And so we're looking for a stay at the beach house, Right? Or we're looking for validation for our beliefs. Or we're looking for information. If we're with this person, we get information about somebody else that we're close to. Or, or we're looking for co-belligerence in whatever cause it is that we have taken up. I'm not saying in every case this is true, but often what is going on when you're doing that, friend, is actually a manipulation where you're showing partiality or favor towards someone in the hopes of getting from them something that you want. In other words, you would never think about it probably this way, but if you look at it, what you're doing is you're using people to serve needs that you have, which is not what we're to do as Christians. But because, as is at least in this case, because you're judging with self-interest, you don't see necessarily what's coming, and so eventually the relationship you coveted winds up backfiring. Friends, just understand, I'm not saying there's no such thing as discernment. I'm not saying, there, saying there's no such thing as wisdom. But friends, understand that sometimes we are really bad judges. And so that's one reason to just get out of the business of judging people altogether get out of the partiality game just love people instead second reason if i've not made you positive and encouraging and feel warm and fuzzy already number two is you are a really bad sinner it's another reason to get out of the game you're a really bad sinner look at verse eight james says if you really fulfill the royal law according to the scripture you shall love your neighbor as yourself you're doing well if you're doing that, you're doing well. The royal law is the law that is to be lived out by every kingdom, heir, and citizen of God's kingdom. It's the biblical law as it's been fulfilled and expanded in Jesus. It's the same thing I think that James calls elsewhere the perfect law of liberty. In other words, it is the ethical commands that if you are a follower of Jesus, that you are obligated to obey. It's the royal law. Jesus summarizes the law in two commands in Matthew 22. He says, first, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, strength. Second, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. That's what James picks up on here because that's the relevant part that he's trying to drive home. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. Obedience to that command to love others as ourselves is our obligation as a Christian. And he says, hey, if you're doing that, you're doing well. Pat yourself on the back. Good job. But the question comes, okay, well, what if we don't? Because he's already showed them the ways in which they're not, right? So what if we are not able to love our neighbors as ourselves? Well, verse 9, here's the answer. If you show partiality, if you do show partiality, well, let's just be clear. You are committing sin and are convicted by the law as transgressors. Whoever keeps the whole law but fails in one point has become guilty or accountable for all of it. The reason? For he who said, do not commit murder, also said, 
uh, sorry, do not commit adultery, also said do not murder. And if you do not commit adultery, but you do murder, you become a transgressor of the law. Friends, this is bad news for us in a way because it blows up the way that we typically think about sin, doesn't it? The way we typically think about sin is, okay, like adultery, okay, we know that's bad. That, that's why he picks that example. It's like we, there's no agreement, disagreement there. Adultery is bad. Murder, yeah, bad. Like we're, we're, we're on that page, right? On that same page, we understand that intuitively what's going on in our minds is this hierarchy of sin, right? We think, hey, I never murdered anybody. <laughs> you know, hey, I've been, I've been faithful to my wife that's, or my husband. Like, that, that's so, and good, good. I don't want you to murder people or be unfaithful. That's great, right? But, but the problem is, let's just be honest with ourselves here. If we realize, even in the course of this sermon, maybe, okay, I have been showing partiality over here, you know, dash of partiality over there. Those things, those offenses, don't really necessarily rise up very far on our hierarchy of sin, right? It doesn't, just, it doesn't really stun us or shock us. We're not hit like a ton of bricks with that conviction, maybe. And so we come to this, and James will not allow us to just justify ourselves in that way. It's no big deal. I'm just sweeping under the rug. Hey, it's not as bad as that thing over there, comparison game. No, no, James is not having that. He's not having it. The standard is what? The standard is to love your neighbor as yourself. And so, partiality, favoritism, if you're engaging in that, you're falling short of that standard. And then verse 10, the hammer. For whoever keeps the whole law but fails in one point has become accountable for all of it. Has become guilty of all of it. So if you showed partiality, you're guilty of the whole law. Same as if you've done murder, same as if you've done adultery, same if you cheated on a test, same if you lied to your parents. If you're guilty at one point, you're guilty of the whole thing, he says. Certainly, sins have different earthly consequences. I think we understand that. Sins have different earthly outcomes. But friends, do not be deceived. To break God's law at even one point is to break it at every point. The way to think about this, then, is that God's exam, God's test, is pass-fail. It's not an A, B, C, D, E, F. It's pass-fail. And one offense puts you on the fail side. Like, well, gosh, jeez, that seems really harsh. I just want to ask you, Maybe tonight at your Super Bowl party. How many drops of urine would you be okay to be in your drink before you're going to see, like, ah, I don't think I want to drink that? I don't know about you, but, like, for me, one drop of urine in a cup, that's enough, right? Agree? Are we there? One hair and a plate of food, I'm done. I just don't want to eat it. Friends, this is the way it is with the holiness of God. It's a poor analogy because God's holiness and purity and beauty and splendor are far more significant than what I'm going to drink a cup with something nasty in it. God's holiness is such that one breach of his law, now however, however slight we may think it to be, offends and tarnishes his matchless glory. And so, friend, the truth is, regardless of what you may think about yourself, you are a really bad sinner. Not according to Michael, but according to the Bible. You're a really bad sinner. Partiality, the stuff, the games all of us play, is no minor offense. Actually, it is a rebellious disregard for the dignity of your fellow image bearers, the people that God made to display his glory in all of the differentiated beauty and I'll just also say all of the quirkiness that he made among us. God has done that to display his creativity and his glory. 
So brother and sister, you need to get out of this game where you're showing partiality towards others. Not just because you're bad at it, although you are, <laughs> but more so because it is offensive to God. Friends, it is a heinous sin that, apart from repentance and faith in Christ, will send you to eternal hell. Because in engaging in this sin, you become just as guilty before God as if you had sinned every sin. You see that? That's verse 10. So, first two reasons, let's cover the last one. You're a bad judge, you're a bad sinner, and now, here's the, the kicker. Actually, if we want to think about ourselves, you are really in need of mercy. You yourself are really in need of mercy so the way the passage this passage breaks up he begins with that imperative right show no partiality now he's going to end this passage with two imperatives two commands those come here in verse 12 so speak and so act as those who are to be judged under the law of liberty those commands for judgment is without mercy to one who has shown no mercy and then gloriously, he says, mercy triumphs over judgment. And so these verses just honestly, I think, are a little bit opaque. And so let's try to unpack it so we can see clearly what they're saying. Friend, you are actually in need of mercy. We've established you're a really bad sinner. And so instead of going around and judging everyone else, and again, I think most of that is happening in our heads, silently, quietly, Maybe we're bringing our spouse in on that or something, but close friends. But for the most part, that's something we're doing in our own heads. Instead of nitpicking everybody else's flaws, instead of evaluating their social class, their standing, the color of their skin, their politics, their educational choices, like whatever it is, instead of evaluating those things, why don't you, as he says, speak and act is those who are to be judged under the law of liberty yourself. In other words, James is saying you need to take a look in the mirror before you go looking out the windshield. Take a look in the mirror and look at yourself. Because you are in need of mercy before you go chasing down everybody else. And so why don't, as someone who is in need of mercy, I think this is his argument here, as someone who is in need of mercy, instead of withholding mercy and judging everyone, why don't you extend the mercy you yourself hope to receive? Because there will be no mercy toward those who show no mercy towards other people. Now why is that? Well, that's because that's a sign if you're a person who is not able to extend mercy to others, then that's probably a sign that you yourself are not in the faith. I mean, so much of James is dealing with, are you really a Christian? What do real Christians do, we talked about? So if you're not able to extend mercy towards others, if you're constantly got to be the judge and heaping that judgment out on others and issuing those verdicts, could be a sign that you yourself are not in the faith if you're doing that you yourself will not receive mercy if you're not doing the word like we talked about last week then you probably have fake faith not real faith so friends you need to extend mercy towards others because you yourselves as really bad sinners are hoping that you yourself are going to receive mercy from the lord and look at this last hopeful phrase that comes in verse 13. Mercy triumphs over judgment. This is the way he wraps up this entire section. Instead of going around judging people, do you not understand that mercy triumphs over judgment? Friends, this is our hope as Christians, that mercy is going to triumph. What we need, friends, as really bad judges and as really bad sinners is mercy. We need someone to withhold from us the things we deserve or else to take for us 
the judgment and the wrath that we deserve. That's what we need. Because we're in a bad place. Sinners, all of us. Friends, if you've never heard this before, if you are a not a Christian yet, then let me just tell you this. Would you believe that there is someone who lived, who never ever showed partiality, and who always loved his neighbor? Friends, we see this fleshed out literally in the life and person of Jesus who incarnates God's own impartiality. Over and over again, we see in the scriptures, God shows no partiality. And then Jesus shows up and we see, wow, there's this human being who is showing no partiality. And so just flip through the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, just see what Jesus is doing. He's eating supper with tax collectors and notorious sinners. It's like, you can't associate with those people. It was a scandal. He, he'd speak extensively with a sexually immoral woman. They're like, do you not know who you're talking to? Of course he knows who he's talking to. He would meet and converse, not just with those folks, but with the religious leaders. He stays up late into the night to hang out with Nicodemus. He's got all these questions for him. Jesus would heal people in his own tribe, and he'd heal people who were not in his tribe. Jesus would forgive the sins of his enemies and also those of his friends. It didn't matter if you were wealthy or poor, if you were a Jew or not a Jew, if you were powerful or powerless, if you were a public out in the open sinner or if you were a private sinner. Jesus did not play the partiality game. He didn't. Instead, he said, I love these words, Matthew 11, come to me all, all who labor and are heavy laden and I'll give you rest no matter who you are no matter what you're doing what you've done color of your skin if you're pro Caesar anti Caesar he didn't care come come if you're weary and heavy laden if you see and feel your need for a savior he said come come all you need friend if you're here and you're not a christian hear this all you need to come to him is to know your need for him that's it all you need to come to him is to feel your need for him and the reason you can come to him is because he is the one that never failed the law at any point never this james 2 10 he never did any of that there was no murder or adultery or favoritism or lying or lusting or anything else he didn't do any of that that is the foundation for how mercy could triumph over judgment because Jesus the sinless one gave his life as a ransom for many he became sin for all of us sinners he did that he took our sins upon himself on the cross and there he absorbed the just judgment of God for our sin so that now God is able to look at us and only extend to us mercy and not judgment because our sins were judged on Jesus friends that's the gospel the cross is the place where mercy triumphs over judgment. It's where really bad judges and really bad sinners find forgiveness and wholeness through faith in Jesus. And friend, if you are here and you don't know Christ today, I urge you to flee to that cross. Believe in Jesus. Recognize your need for him and go to him for everything. I'd love to talk to you more about that after the service you're a christian maybe you've even been convicted by some of these things in the word today you're trying to cling to jesus but you're realizing you still mess up royally with partiality and all sorts of other things in your life well friends the remedy for you is the exact same thing we go to the cross to jesus to find help and strength in our weaknesses and to press on to the day 
that we would be mature and complete, lacking nothing. So friends, go to the cross. Go to the cross. Go to Jesus, who's perfect, matchless, glorious, and who invites you to come in your weariness, in your brokenness, in your half-heartedness, in your struggles, in your, I can barely put one foot in front of the other. Go to Jesus. He understands what it's like to be human. He is a faithful and merciful high priest, and he's able to help you in time of need. Dear brothers, as James urges us here in verse 12, speak and act in your lives as if you are in deep need of his mercy. Because you are. that means as you interact and engage with others whether in this room or outside this room it means you need to stop playing favorites and show mercy to others instead let's pray Lord how thankful we are for the cross how thankful we are for Jesus guilty of the whole law we see because we failed the law at one point God he never failed the law at any point and therefore he is a fitting and worthy sacrifice for us Lord would you help us to live our life and order our steps after his to see how it was that he interacted and engaged other people not with self-interest, not with manipulation, not with cunning, not with what's in it for me, not with partiality, but to love and love and love and to show mercy to those who needed it. By your Spirit, would you help us to do likewise? Help us to do likewise with one another here in this room, in this church, And as we leave from this room to go forward to Super Bowl parties and work tomorrow and school and all the things that will take our attention. Give us grace and yes, more mercy, I pray, to shine as lights in your darkness. We pray in Jesus' name.